fall is a time of letting go. But as fall begins, I have found myself focusing on a particular aspect of both holding on and letting go. So I'm going to tell you a couple of stories. The first is this week I had a pain in my abdomen and it was hitting me on and off through the day. And I immediately went to coloring my entire physicality as somehow flawed. Something is wrong with me. And I was forecasting the medical tests that I would need. <laughs> Catastrophizing in the back of my mind. And along with that, I noticed there was this kind of cloud where I couldn't get totally happy because of that worry that I was creating in my mind. Because of the story that I had told myself about the pains in my body, I let it come into my emotions. And emotions are simply feelings that one has because of thoughts. So the pains were created or added to by my own thoughts, adding to the suffering much worse than the actual pains themselves, which weren't that painful. So what I'm describing is this effect that Joe Dispenza talks about as kind of this mind body feedback loop where the mind or the, the body says something to the mind like, Hey, David, I'm having a pain. And the mind says back, yep, you've probably got a big problem. And then my body says, great. Now I'm going to flood your system with these neurochemicals that make you depressed and anxious. So you feel worse. And the cycle continues. Then the body picks up on, oh, I'm feeling bad, worse. And the cycle continues until you decide to consciously stop it. Do you recognize this, this loop? And isn't it time that we stop this cycle? So I had taken a temporary tiny issue and I had written off all of the health that my whole body had. And I was focusing on that issue. Now, I'm not saying that, that there aren't serious health issues, but I am saying that we can forget about the good. We can choose to cloud everything over in our bodies, in our minds, in our emotions, in our spirit. And this is what I call painting everything bad. So let me shift focus a little bit. This week, I started a brand new job on Monday. And a few people asked me, David, aren't you excited? And I said, no, I don't know exactly what it's going to be like until after I start. That's just how I am. There were ups on the first day. And then I ended the first day in a good mood and I painted my entire canvas, this beautiful color. And then there were downs on the second day. So what did I do? I painted the entire job as, uh oh, just painted it with this gray color. Then on the third day, it was mostly ups and the rest of the week, it was mostly ups. And so I began to paint it um, this beautiful color again. So you see what's happening after each micro event, I was waiting to see what color I was going to wash the whole canvas with. And then I realized that, you know, I was a part of this equation. I was co-creating and creating and not even giving the job a chance, not being open. The truth is that the job has elements that I've been dreaming about hoping that I would find a job that had these elements. And so many of the elements were there and there were some pleasant surprises that were things that I didn't even ask for. So this job was answered prayer and more. But because I was waiting for the other shoe to drop, I was hypersensitive to any condition. And I was quite ready to paint my canvas dark gray at a moment's notice. So are there areas, are there spheres in your life where you are so hypersensitive like this that you will paint your canvas a different color? I looked for examples of this theme elsewhere. For the past couple of years, uh, I've been dealing with neighborhood noises on and off, 
from off season fireworks to loud music, sometimes at 3 a.m. in the morning to dogs barking. And I started to paint my experience gray over those years about this place, my attitude about this place. And I began to expect gray and I began to be hypersensitive to every noise. And what also came along with that was I attached a story and I ascribed intent to things that happen. And what I mean by that is instead of just the dog barking happening, I saw a picture of people that were mean and inconsiderate and didn't care about their dog and didn't care about their neighbors. And they were being intentionally rude to me and to everyone else around them. I was making up that story. I had no, you know, they could be, that could be totally untrue. And I realized over the past, I'd say three months that all these conditions are quite temporary. They go away after an hour or two and they aren't a daily occurrence. And I started to see that probably 99% of my living situation is very good. And with that, I began to get motivated. I bought new furniture. I did some more decluttering. I began to take back the reins from my reactive mind about my house. And I stopped. Well, I didn't entirely stop it <laughs> because in the middle of my writing this talk yesterday, guess what happened? Loud music started. And this was a real chance for me to in real time say, listen, this is not going to last forever and you don't need to ascribe intent. It's a Saturday night. These people aren't doing this to spite you, just relax. So I was able to calm myself down using this method. And I wondered further if the idea of this painting my canvas gray and ascribing intent extended to people, and it does. So I'll ask you this question. Is there someone in your life who has let you down just a little bit? Maybe it's recently, maybe it's a long time ago. Someone who maybe you're holding a little resentment for uh, because of one activity. Where have you painted people in your life gray? Maybe painting them out of your inner circle, maybe painting them out of your life. That decision is up to you. And sometimes it's a good decision, but it can be limiting. So I'm not talking about every situation and every relationship, but there are people in your life who sometimes you, are, are mostly good for you. You love them and they let you down a little bit and you tend to kind of place a little X over them or maybe push them away in your heart for a while. So what would happen if you decided that there may be more good than bad? in this particular friendship, this particular relationship. And some might call this, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I call it, don't paint people out of your life. And, and I think this comes from viewing people in a monolithic way. In other words, we view people and it's easy. It's happening a lot today. All you have to do is turn on the TV set or look on Facebook where people are monolithic. They are either good or bad. They're on your side. They're not on your side. And, you know, on Facebook, we can block the people that are not on our side. And that's happened to me. But then I realized, ooh, that person has that one viewpoint in that one area. Maybe I shouldn't have blocked them because the rest of them I, I get along with. So people seeing people as monolithic is very limiting. And I found this quote that popped up on Facebook this week that I thought was very appropriate. It says, no one in this world is pure and perfect. If you avoid everyone for their mistakes, you will be alone in this world. So judge less and love more. I love that quote and it's on the unity Facebook page. So. I want to end with talking about how can we be wiser with our paintbrush. First, 
you recognize that you have the paintbrush and your canvas is your world. So even if someone or some job or some situation has let you down beyond repair, where you need to logically say, okay, this person is not gonna belong in my life, don't let them splash gray onto your canvas, right? Such behaviors as unforgiveness, such behaviors as holding permanent resentment is painting your own canvas gray instead of, right? Instead of saying, all right, you take your canvas and go over there, right? And blessing, I bless you. I let you move on through my mind in peace, right? So the next way that we can be wiser with our canvas and with our paintbrush is by keeping perspective that your canvas is a huge wall art piece. It is your masterpiece that is you. It's an analogy for you. So don't turn one moment and one situation into something larger on the canvas. So I asked that question, is there one situation one person, one aspect of your life that is gray washing your canvas, that is taking away your paintbrush from you for a moment. <laughs> you know, it's so easy to imagine like the, the visual of a family member taking, taking your paintbrush away from you and dabbing it in gray and just uh, 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 doing that over your canvas. You know, I mean, we've all been there with friends or family members where we feel maybe out of control for a second that anger lets us give that person more power in our lives than maybe they're deserving at the moment. So, and I wanna come back to this idea about ascribing in, intent, which is the, another, the other tip that I have. And I'll, and I'll walk back to the situation of, one night I heard music at four in the morning and it was on a Saturday night before I had to give a talk but it wasn't actually loud enough to keep me awake. It was just in the background, but I realized it was there. And do you know what kept me awake? The music wasn't keeping me awake. It was the story that I had about these mean, irresponsible people, how dare they? And I realized at that moment, the sound was totally fine with me. It was, it was my anger and my attitude and my perception about the people behind the music that kept me up. So I actually, I think I told you this, I got in my car and I drove over there. It, it's actually around the block. And by the time I got home, I, I could do nothing. By the time I got home, the music stopped. So that's kind of a new way to look at things. The actual thing that's bothering you, is that what's bothering you or is it the, the the intent that you think somebody has behind it. A perfect example is this. Someone comes into your lane in front of you, or someone is driving too slow on the freeway. You're ascribing intent. At least I have many times where you feel this person is, I'm angry because how dare they, right? Until the day, have you ever accidentally cut off somebody? We all have, right, in our lives. And we're, we're thinking, oh gosh, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. But the person behind you, they are saying, what a jerk, that person cut me off intentionally. And so it, it's real, it's therapy to really go through the process of you being the one who is driving too slow or driving too fast or cutting someone off accidentally because you realize that not everyone, everyone is kind of just trying to get by. Right. And it's not often that they're trying to do mean things to people around them. So I find that very helpful. The final thing I will say is along the topic of this fun word called catastrophize. I go back to the pains that I talked to earlier in the talk. And I realized that if every pain I ever had. That I worried that it was going to be serious became serious. I would have had 100,000 surgeries by now. But I've, <laughs> I see BJ laughing. I would have had 100,000 surgeries by now. I would have had maybe 5,000 heart attacks. But I've had two surgeries. 
a root canal and getting my molars out when I was a kid, right? So that gives me real perspective in terms of the power of catastrophizing in a bad way. And with that, it reminded me of a Myrtle Fillmore quote from one of her letters. She said, what do you think you can accomplish by being tense or anxious? Surely God does not find it necessary to become anxious or to strain in any way. So that, that always helps me. Yeah, God, God doesn't stress out and get anxious and uh, catastrophize. And look at all the things that God is creating for this universe. So why can't I? So let's think of a situation where you may have a habit of, cat, of, of catastrophizing or worrying incessantly and ask yourself, is worrying helping? David Bruner, uh, another minister often says, worrying is rehearsing. And I forgot who, I think that's Terry Cole Whitaker. Worrying is rehearsing. You're rehearsing a mindset of catastrophe. So instead of worrying, there's a friend of mine named Kathleen Farrell who said, instead of worrying, ask, what is right about this situation? The moment something bad happens, right? Ask yourself, what is right about this? That could mean what is the lesson about this? Or it could be just a strange way to kind of just slap you into the reality of it's not as serious as you may think it is. So this Wednesday, again, is fall equinox, and some of you may be feeling it already. So it's a time for letting go. So today I invite you to look at these areas where you're painting things, situations, and people in a monolithic way as either all good or all bad. And it can be counterproductive in terms of where we want to go in this spiritual life that we've committed to. So let's stop throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Let's remind each other when we're doing so. And think about what color this fall your canvas is going to be. Thank you, and so it is. Standing here in your presence In a grace so relentless I am one By perfect love Wrapped within the arms of heaven In a peace that lasts forever Sinking deep In mercy see I'm one Drawing close, stirred by grace, and all my heart is yours. All fear moved, I breathe you in, I lean into your love. Oh. Yeah. 